My name's Pop, and I want to tell you a true story from Colorado history. I'm telling you up front that it's true because if I didn't, you might find it hard to believe. I certainly did the first time I heard it. It's the story of a woman named Kate Slaughterback. Everybody who knew Kate could see that she was a strong, independent woman. She lived on the plains of northern Colorado, which is a harsh land with blistering hot summers, brutally cold winters, frequent, unexpected, and uncontrollable windstorms. In many ways, she was typical of the women who lived in that part of Colorado in the early 20th century. But in October of 1925, when Kate was 32 years old, she did something that few of her contemporaries, male or female, could have done. And it made her a legend. I'm going to tell you what she did, but first, let me tell you a little bit about her background. Kate was born in a log cabin near Longmont, Colorado, in 1893. Her parents, the McHales, named her Catherine, but they always called her Kate. And just two years after she was born, her mother died, and so Kate and her two brothers were raised by their father and their grandparents. After Kate graduated from high school, she went to the St. Joseph School of Nursing in Denver. This was during World War I. And so she soon found herself taking care of wounded soldiers who'd been brought back from overseas and were at a hospital in Denver. And then after the war, she and her husband, Jack Slaughterback, got a 640-acre homestead just outside of Greeley, Colorado. It was a hard life. They worked 10 to 12 hours a day in the field just to keep things going. And it must have been too hard for Jack because after a couple of years, he ran off and left Kate to take care of the farm all by herself. And she did a fine job of that. She had lots of animals, pigs and cows and goats and turkeys and chicken, sheep, became a crack shot with her rifle to protect those animals from coyotes. She even used that rifle often for hunting to put a little meat on the table. She made some extra money making butter and honey from her beehives. She even had a small moonshine still. She was smart enough to build it right next to the goat pen so that the smell of those animals would overpower the aroma of that illegal alcohol. So she didn't have much money. It was She had a hard life, but she was always interested in helping her neighbors. She used her nursing skills to frequently help deliver babies. And during a flu epidemic, she nursed many of her neighbors back to health. She, she knew she didn't have much, but she also knew there were people who had even less than she did. And so when she found out about a nearby farmer, Mr. Adamson, who had more children than he could feed, she went to see him and she adopted one of his children, a little boy named Ernie, and took him home with her to be her son. Now, Ernie was with her on the day that she became a legend. They started ordinarily enough. She did a little work in the field. She fed the animals. She fixed lunch. And all morning, she heard gunshots coming from a lake near her house. And she knew that, knew that there were hunters there shooting duck. And she decided that after lunch, she'd go down to the pond and see if they'd left any duck. Sometimes they did. Sometimes they couldn't find them. Sometimes they just, there was too much trouble to take them home and they would just leave some ducks lying there. She thought if she could find a couple, it'd make a nice dinner for her and Ernie. So after lunch, she saddled up Brownie, her, her favorite horse. Well, actually he was her only horse. And she sat Ernie up on the saddle in front of her and grabbed her rifle, which she never left on without, and she headed down to the lake, to the pond. So when she got there, before she could actually get to the pond, she had to open a gate and go through a wire fence. And so she got off of her horse, took her rifle with her, and just as she slipped the wire noose from around the gate post that kept the gate closed, she heard the unmistakable and blood-curdling sound of rattles rattling. And she looked down and sure enough, right there at the 
beside the fence, all coiled up and ready to strike, was a gigantic rattlesnake. Well, Kate didn't hesitate. She threw that rifle to her shoulder and went, bam, and shot that snake's head off. And as she was turning to go back to, to, to Ernie, she heard a whizzing sound and she looked back and she saw three more huge rattlesnakes heading straight for her. And again, she didn't hesitate, threw that rifle to her shoulder, bam, bam, bam. And she killed all three of those rattlesnakes. And then she turned again and started back to Brownie and to, and to Ernie. And then she heard a sound like, a, like the wind whistling through the grass, but there was no wind. And when she turned around, she saw at least 20 more rattlesnakes heading right for her. Well, she knew she didn't have enough ammunition to kill that many rattlesnakes. So she started looking desperately around for something to protect herself. And the only thing she could find was a sign, a wooden sign on a wooden pole sitting right by the lake. And ironically enough, what that sign said was no hunting. But those hunters had been ignoring that sign all day, all morning. And those rattlesnakes that were about to attack her were certainly ignoring it. So Kate grabbed that sign and as the snakes descended on her, she started swinging that sign for all she was worth. She was smacking and cracking and whacking right and left. She later said that some of those snakes even somehow or other managed to launch themselves up in the air and she had to swing that sign and hit them just like she was using a baseball bat against a fastball. Well, the snakes kept coming and Kate kept fighting. And after two hours, two hours, she didn't hear any more snakes. And she looked around and she didn't see any more live snakes. The ground around her was littered with dead snakes she decided it was over. And so and she, she was exhausted. Sweat was pouring off of her. Her face was beet red from the heat and the exhaustion. She was shaking so badly she could hardly walk now that she could finally let into her fears. But she staggered over to Brownie and she clambered up on, gave Ernie a big hug and headed for home. Well, about halfway home, she met a neighbor who was coming the other way in his wagon. And he took one look at her and he could see that something terrible had happened. And he said, Kate, what's wrong? And she said, I've been fighting rattlesnakes for two hours. He said, two hours? How many of them were there? She said, I don't rightly know. I was too busy killing them to count them. But there were a lot of them. He said, well, you must have stirred up a nest of them migrating rattlesnakes. They move around this time of year. Did any of them bite you? She said, no, 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 it's a miracle, but none of them bit me. He said, well, let's go find out how many there are. Well, Kate agreed to go back because she was starting to get a little bit of a plan about what she might do with those dead rattlesnakes. So she tied her horse to the, to the back of the wagon. She and Ernie got in the wagon and she and the neighbor went back to the pond. So in effect, Kate Slaughterback went back to the scene of the slaughter. And the, the neighbor had wash tubs in his, in his back of his wagon, and they filled up three wash tubs with dead rattlesnakes, and they carefully counted them. And they found out that Kate had killed, single-handedly killed, 140 rattlesnakes. Well, they loaded those snakes into the wagon, went home, and Kate started implementing her plan for turning those rattlesnakes into revenue. She skinned them. She hung the skins up on her clothesline. She cut the rattles off and she put them aside, figuring she could sell those to neighbors and curiosity seekers. And the, the neighbor who had helped her, he couldn't wait to tell everybody what this tiny five foot four, 110 pound woman had done. And the local newspaper picked up the story. And then the national newspapers picked up the story. And then international newspapers picked up the story. And soon, Kate was famous far beyond Colorado. 
And all the newspapers were calling her the same thing. They were calling her Rattlesnake Kate. Well, meanwhile, Kate is thinking, selling those skins is a good idea, but I got another, another plan. You know, people say that if life gives you lemons, you should make lemonade. Well, life had given Kate Slaughterback rattlesnakes, and she decided to make a fashion statement. She took 50 of those skins, and she made herself a dress. Now, it's the 1920s, so she made herself a flapper dress. And then she took a few more of those skins and made some accessories. She made herself a headband and a necklace and a bracelet and some shoes. And she started wearing that outfit everywhere she went, to any kind of fancy party she went to. She even got a patent on it so that anybody else who wanted to make a dress like that, I don't know who would, but anybody who did would have to pay her for the privilege. And she soon became world famous, and she enjoyed her fame. And she kept thinking about different ways that she could turn rattlesnakes into revenue. She kept killing rattlesnakes and skinning them and, and selling the, the skins for a dollar a piece and selling the rattles for two dollars a piece. She even took a taxidermy course and she learned to stuff those snakes and she could put them in realistic poses, make ashtrays out of them or give them to people to use as a doorstop to, to frighten their visitors. She even learned to, she, to, to catch, started catching live rattlesnakes and learned to milk them of their poison, their venom, and sold that venom to a science company. So I guess you could say that for the rest of her life, Kate milked her success and her fame as a rattlesnake person. Well, as I said earlier, she enjoyed being famous. And some folks said she even exaggerated some of her adventures to increase her legend. But we know a couple of things for sure about her because an eyewitness has confirmed that she killed single-handedly 140 rattlesnakes. We also know that she made a dress out of some of those skins. And the way we know that is that in 1969, before she died, she, she donated that dress to the History Museum in Greeley, Colorado. And it's still there in a glass case. You can go and see it if you want to. And when Kate died, she was buried in Mizpah Cemetery in Platteville, Colorado. And if you'd like to go and pay your last respects to her, if you find that headstone, you'll see that it has engraved on it her parents' full names. But the only name it gives to Kate is what everybody called her, Rattlesnake Kate. <laughs>